Welcome to Act 3, the podcast where we explore how to thoughtfully shape the rest of our lives. I'm your host, Kara Gray. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching service where I help executives and professionals plan their Act 3. For more information, stay tuned until the end. Today, I welcome Dave Evans to the podcast. Dave is a lecturer in the product design program at Stanford, management consultant, and co-founder of the iconic gaming company, Electronic Arts. Having participated in forming the corporate cultures at Apple and EA, Dave decided his best work was helping organizations build creative environments where people could do great work and love doing it. And maybe along the way, answer the question, what should I do with my life? Helping people get traction on that question finally took Dave to Cal and Stanford and continues to be his life's work. Dave is also the co-author of Designing Your Life, the follow-up, Designing Your Work Life, and the post-pandemic version, Designing Your New Work Life. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Good to be with you, Kara. Cool. So in a nutshell, Designing Your Life is about owning the agency that you have to decide how you're going to live and truly design, you know, how that experience is going to be. And I want to focus this conversation in the context of Act 3, retirement, encore years. But there's a couple of things I'm curious about that are outside of that range. And so I wanted to Ooh. ask you, in general, I see you have you did publish the post-pandemic version. I can only imagine that there's been an uptick of interest in designing your life post-pandemic. Tell me your experiences with that. Well, the post-pandemic, so there, so, so the second book, which was originally released in 2020, um, actually February 25th, about two weeks before Shelter in Place started. Um, so great timing. Uh, <laughs> with designing your work life. And then we, the second edition of that same book. So so warning to readers, don't, don't buy designing your work life. It's exactly the same as designing your new work life, except there's four more chapters, a new introduction. You get more for your money. Buy the <laughs> um, all the other stuff's still in there. So buy second edition. Um, and we wrote that book because the publisher recognized it wasn't so much that there was an uptick in the second one. There's a huge downtick in the first one because rather than think about work, everybody's thinking about, am I going to die? You know, the, um, so during 2020, people were thinking about other things. Um, yeah, then, for sure. you know, post pandemic with particular remote work and all that gigging and then followed quickly by the great resignation, uh, which is still going on the quiet quitting, you know, well, the work world just went through a complete hissy fit. What the heck happened? You know, so we had a lot to say about that, which we call disruption design. What do you do when you get disrupted? Uh, disrupt, mm. Define as a, a major personal, regional or global event. Um, and they're different, but the same in that they share the attribute of after which you say to yourself, wow. Things will never be the same again. Um, and during that time, 20, 2020 and 2021, both my partner Bill and I went through all three of those, all personal, regional, and global disruptions. You know, I lost my wife to cancer during 2020. Um, Bill lost both his parents over a two year, uh, two year, both his mother and mother in law over a period of those two years. Um, Northern California damn near burned under the ground. I was less than a mile from an evacuation line. Um, that's a regional disruption. And then there's this thing called COVID. You probably heard about it. Um, and which disrupted yeah. everything. So there was a lot going on. And so that that was what that was about. And so, yeah, there was a big uptick in the question, holy cow, now what? Yeah. Uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, you take, taking on the responsibility of your own agency for your life. You know, that's really what the big resignation was all about. The great resignation was all about like, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I think what really happened was uh, the COVID pandemic really got everybody's attention. First of all, just get through it. Yeah. And then like, what what are we doing here? I mean, is this is this really the life I want to go back to? Right. Like, you know, you know, I I it was a horrible time. I felt like I I nearly died. I know people, you know, everybody knows somebody who did die. Yeah. Literally. And like, whoa, if not now, when? So mm -hmm. that was it was a, a mass reflective moment, which is still going on. Yeah. And that changed the game a little bit. So that, yeah, we have seen, we've seen the cover, not so much the conversation change. Yeah. Conversation, same conversation. Um, yeah. But uh, the intensity has gone up. Yeah, I would imagine a lot more interest in it generally. So another question along those lines, you mentioned quiet quitting. Do you see, or how do you reconcile like taking agency and designing your own life with 
corporate productivity? Well, sort of quiet quitting, um, you know, is a, is a fancy name for what we used to call mailing it in. The, um, <laughs> uh, but with all due respect, I don't, I don't, we don't recommend quiet quitting. It's immoral no. and unethical. You know, you're ripping off your employer. It's, it's, mail, it, it's, it's, you know, quitting on the job. Yeah. Um, and um, for many people, that's just a, co a confession of what they were already doing. Our thesis on that, by the way, is not that it, nothing changed relative to the work experience and the work. Where we go, like what changed? What's the new problem? You know, there's all these articles about it, you know, which, yeah. we, which we skeptically say snarky things about. Um, because if you look at the Gallup engagement data on employers, yep. going back to when they started taking it 23 years ago, it's been two to three between two out of three and three out of four employees within the survey, mostly North American range, have been disengaged ever since they started taking the data. And 15 to 20% have been severely disengaged, like actively, you know, way past quiet quitting, right? Yeah. Um, so what happened in the pandemic is nothing new. The article's like, this new workforce, literally there's a lot of business, this new workforce is looking for things like purpose and the connectivity between their life and their work. Like, whoa, what a deep insight. They're actually, oh, they're human beings. Oh, wow. No well, one told me. Um, yeah. we, we find most a lot of the insights, the insights from Harvard Business Review, you know, um, frankly, um, offensive. They're so stupid. Um, <laughs> because what's going our line is there is no new problem. There is a new intolerance for an incredibly old problem. Yeah. And yeah. that old problem is, this doesn't mean anything to me. My life doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. And so people have finally gotten it that they're not willing to put up that. And you have a whole generational, I mean, yes. so the, the, the um, late millennials and especially Gen Z um, are just saying, no. Yeah. Nope, not doing that. Thanks, yeah. thanks for sharing, you know, that, uh, that life mom and dad had, that life all you guys have, like not going there. Hey, put in your 15 years to become a managing partner and then you get to be in the profit pool and then life will be great. Um, And then the second response is, you know, that's uh, right. You know, that's okay. No, I grew up there. So employers are freaking out. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, I think that's that's going to be what's going to be interesting to watch as we move yeah, forward. That's a whole other, but meanwhile, but meanwhile, back to the people who are maybe no longer going to be employed, at least not the yes. way to be. That's another yes. conversation too. Yeah. So let's move back to those people who are moving into their encore years in their Act Three. Yep. Um, you talk about the Good Time Journal, and yep. I love this concept. Um, about ask, and I, I think I might even start asking my own clients like to start a historical good time journal sure. so they can, so they can understand like when they feel really in flow and when they're very aligned with either work or projects that they're working on or whatever it is. I also like the idea of prototyping and testing ideas. Another thing that I do with my clients in, in a slightly different way, but you do have to prototype, you do have to test, you do have to come up, brainstorm ideas, yeah. and then actually test them in the real world. And I think that in your encore years and your third act, your retirement, whatever you want to call it these days, it's a real opportunity to redesign your life, if you will. Yeah. And it, I mean, this is also assuming some financial stability along the way that has to be number one. But I think that, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a fantastic time and maybe even more flexible, especially for boomers who probably haven't had thoughts about designing your life and taking real agency for how you're living. So um, my question for you after all that is what other exercises and ways would you encourage people at this stage in life based on your work to start exploring? Well, so at Stanford these days, um, in fact, I've actually been knocked down to an adjunct lecture because, you know, like... <laughs> Like the people listening to this podcast, I, I'm in the same age category. So I just turned 70 last Easter Sunday, actually. Um, and so this is my 70th year, and I'm spending this year really worth, worth I didn't take a sabbatical, uh, but I've taken a sofa, which is a season of focused attention. Like I, I kind of hit the sofa a little bit this year. I slowed down a little bit, didn't stop, which a real sabbatical would be. Um, and frankly, the, the real reason I didn't take a full on sabbatical is I was just too scared, you know, these, you know because, um, you know, I'm hopelessly extroverted. And if you take a sabbatical, you literally disconnect. You turn off the email. You just shut down. I mean, a serious, full-on sabbatical, you know, done in the, the Jewish tradition. You really step away. And my terror would be 
you know, if, when you finish that, I'm kind of go, okay, everybody, I'm back. Hello, call me. You know, if the phone doesn't ring, I'm freaking out. You know, I, I suffer what I call the Tinkerbell disease. If you're clapping, he actually exists. You know, um, yeah. You know, you know, I spent a lot of time out there in the world. Um, so I slowed down a little bit in order that I'd still get that echo from this, from the feedback of talking to people like you. Um, but nonetheless, that question really comes up, you know, and, and what, what are we changing? What are we looking for? Yeah. Um, and we go back to this terminology of wayfinding versus navigation. You know, we, we talk about this a little bit in the book, uh, and these are technical terms in design thinking. So navigation is the methodology of directing yourself when you know exactly where you are, you know exactly where you're going, you know the data about the, the territory in between those two locations. It's what your GPS unit does really, really well. Looks kind of like a straight line or as close to it as you can get, depending on the traffic. Um, and that's navigating. And it works great. Now, by the way, we navigate a ton. We are drowning in technology that tells us we have the right answer to things. We're used to that GPS thing. We ought to know what we're doing. And most of the people who are contemplating this question with you, you know, if they've already got, you mentioned financial stability is paramount. Yeah. But almost presumed a little bit in your listenership, which means yeah. these people have been sufficiently successful. Yes. They've got their act together and they were kind of in charge of at least themselves, if not something else. Yep. So they've been navigating because they're competent. They've actually got life sort of figured out for a long time. So they're pretty good at navigating. Guess what? This next act thing, never done that before. We're going to a place we've never been before. Now I'm way yeah. funny. So now I, where am I? Where? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Where exactly am I? I mean, I you know, I know what my address is. I know what day it is. It's Tuesday. You know, but I don't really know where I'm we're, you know, it's, um, the chair didn't feel the same anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly if I've actually retired conventionally, done a retirement thing. Yeah. So I don't really know exactly where I am. Sure as heck don't know where I'm going. And I've never been through that space in between. Never been 70 going on 80. You know, coming up on three years widowed. I'm in a new relationship. Like, you know, I've tried dating at 69. Talk about weird. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what's going on. And now I have to make it up as I go along. So yeah. I'm making it up as I go along. I can't do the right thing. I can only do the next thing. And I do the next thing based on my best guess. So I start here. My, now watch my hands. This is really important. I don't, there's no such thing as going here. Go right to there because I don't know where there is. That's right. So I go thing one and then I go thing two. Then I go thing two. And then I actually back up. And then I spiral up into a tree and I look around. And they go, oh, that was a bad idea. Then I go back over here. Then I go here. And then, and then I finally end up over there. Then I go, yeah, I think this is about where I wanted to end up. And now I'm actually in the here, which used to be there, that I want to be. That's wayfinding. Yeah. Here's the really important takeaway. Okay. <laughs> For those of you on, on radio, you know, it's going to have to you know, there's the straight line. My hand zoom. My hand goes right to there. That's way navigation. In wayfinding, up, down, bam, 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 is the shortest distance between those two points possible. That squiggly line is the shortest distance between those two points for mortals in Earth time. Because you can't know. It wasn't inefficient compared to the straight line. You should have been able to figure out that straight line doesn't exist. Stay That's with me. It doesn't exist. <laughs> You're shooting on yourself in a place that doesn't exist. Yeah. So, oh, we're in discovery mode here, right? Yeah. So, you know, back to what exercises of people. So I now teach in the Distinguished Career Institute at Stanford. Yes. That's the only job I've got anymore, um, which is a fancy name for the gap year for grownups. You, you know, if you're lucky enough to be one of the approximately 10% of applicants Stanford allows to come and write them a really big check uh, to hang out for a year, you get to yeah. talk. You know, after you write them the really big check, I'm I'm free. Um, and and this we spend a lot of time with these people, and um, I'll probably want to have a, lot, a lot to say about what's going on in that experience. Yeah, a brand new so the the 2023 cohort of 41 people. You know, a widely diverse group of people, career diverse, gender diverse, ethnic diverse. I mean, really, different. <laughs> they're all distinguished careers, but they're not all not all white hedge fund managers from New York. No, we got plenty of those. Um, <laughs> Because they can afford it, but the uh, we also got you know the unusual Indian person running the NGO thing, or we got the person from China doing this, yeah, yeah, um, and um, and 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 they're working on this thing, 
And one thing I'll tell them to anticipate, and I just met with them last week at almost the end of their first quarter, the first, you know, about, they've been here about, about a little over a month, um, about halfway through their first quarter. And like, guess what? So how many of you, it's more different already than you thought? And they've been planning this for over a year. So they're like ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Weeks, kind of going, oh, it's more different than I thought. And guess what? I talk about it, you know, are you exploring or are you evaluating or are you launching different mindsets about your future? Sure. What usually happens is explore takes longer than they think. Yeah. Because it's more interesting than they thought. They are more interesting than they thought. And once they give themselves permission to not have an idea, but just have a set of curiosities, yeah. it suddenly blows up in their lap and they kind of go, ooh, I think I think I may need to wander around a little longer. Yeah. That's the tip is first of all, people are like, okay, I want to get, I want to get, so get, get that evaluation part done. Let's get started. No, 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 no. The exploration is a project in and of itself. Yeah. It's not just a quick waiting room to get through. Um, no. It, it, in fact, it's the most important work. So give yourself permission to allow somebody else to show up. Yep. Anyway, a long answer to your question. I probably veered off the uh, off topic. So, you know. Which not at all. That was Great. And the kind of wisdom that I was looking for, Dave. <laughs> so I appreciate it. As my late wife used to say, if he's awake, he's talking. So, you know, watch it. Yeah. Back to the DCI program. <laughs> Back to the DCI program. Yeah. Uh, so I've interviewed a couple of your former students. Yeah, the alumni, right. Yeah. In, in that program. That's and how we got together. One of those guys put us That together. is yeah. how we got together. And incorporating personal practices you also yeah. talk about in the book as well yeah. things like meditation journaling yoga yep most of the clients that i work with are executives professionals fairly pragmatic business people yep what's your approach to convincing these folks that the personal yeah. practices are essential yeah because they're really good at gsd getting stuff often said differently done right You're correct like, yeah uh, and and they and they like it. And the, by the way, that get stuff done lifestyle, yeah, um, highly effective. Yeah, great feedback. You get paid for it. You get passed on the back for it. You get promoted for it. You get stuff. You know, you get to stay. You know, get a free copy of the thing to take home with you. You know, I mean, um, it's fabulous. You know, um, so it's you know it's really easy to keep going on. It. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of you know that reflective slowdown practice interiority thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mindfulness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so always important in life. Is it more important at this point in life? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's a big deal. And we can talk quite extensively, but and literally when this, you know, when we click off on the Zoom call, I'm going to go back to where I work in an um, outline version 3.1 of the third book, um, which we're trying to get proposed before Thanksgiving. And, you know, if we, if we sell it, we maybe could talk about it next year. Yeah. Um, and it talks very much, and it's very much focused on this issue. So I, so we have lots to say we haven't even said before about it. Um, but one of our observations is, you know, um, what people are looking for is a more meaningful experience. You know, so what do I do in my life? You know, and, um, and really, if I reframe that question to how do I steward and expend my aliveness? as opposed to what do I do with my life, which sort of already presupposes that the answer is I should be doing something. Yeah. Doesn't say how, how, how should I, how am I, how am I, how, how is my life? Yeah, or how am I feeling alive? I'm feeling about my life. Yeah, am I feeling alive? You know, Joseph Campbell said it's really about aliveness at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So if what I want is to the experience of more aliveness, which very often gets interpreted as, 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 as meaningful to me, you know, then uh, where is that to be found? So we make a distinction. We sort of come up with a model about this. And part of that is, you know, we're going to separate impact from meaning. So impact is an outcome. You know, I shipped, you know, we, we just sold, you know, we sold 1.1 million books. Yep. That's an impact. Yep. You know, what's that mean to me? I don't know. You know, it, you know, it means, that, you know, you know, 1.1 million times our average royalty rate is the total revenue that, you know, most of which we send to our agent. But, the, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Maybe I know. Because <laughs> well, Bill and I have to split the rest, right? So, um, and that's an impact. Now, the, the meaning is, oh, what that means to me is I'm a great writer. What that means to me is there are 
you know, maybe one in three of the people who bought the book are really touched by it. So it might be, you know, a third of a million people whose hearts have touched. So I can, I do, can I see their lives? Or, you know, or, you know, it's a legacy to my kids. Or what, what does it mean? Yeah. What's the story? Um, and, and when does that meaning come to pass? When does meaning happen? Well, impact, the way we plan to create impact, get stuff done, do, roll in the world, is invariably focused on the future. I'm, I'm, I'm manipulating the present in order to create something in the future. So the present is all about create the next, you know, I'm working on the next book. Yeah. Now my focus, the rest of today will be on a day, probably in the first or second week in November, when I send a document to my editor at Penguin Random House to see if she likes it. That's the date that's on my mind. It's not right here. I'm not here. I'm there. The experience of meaning making, the experience of aliveness is always in the present. It's always in the moment. So what all that, that practice stuff shares is it facilitates what we call moment making. Because if meaning making is what you're after, the prerequisite is moment making. You've got to both be in the present and that present has to be one of those alive, evoking experiences, of which we think there's a couple. Um, and in fact, four. You know, they're, yeah, they're coherence, flow, community, and my personal favorite, wonder. Mm. Okay, yeah. Okay, come back to that if you want. So there's a four, there's a four moments where meaning can happen. They're all complementary. They share a lot, but they're, they're a little bit different. And so what practices are about, and we can talk, go back to what those are about. They're about developing those affective skills to be aware of the experience you're having in the moment. Yep. And they are techniques to get your attention and therefore your experience into the moment. You know, so you, you have to both be here and you have to be attending to being here. And the here that you're attending to has to be of a certain quality. When all three of those things line up, um, something pretty cool happens. So practices are about developing the affective capacities and faculties for that attention, that experience. And uh, by maintaining those faculties, it's the aerobic training. You know, I mean, I mean, runners will tell you, do you race to train or do you train to race? You know, so if, yeah. if the racing part is the life's really working, then how do you train for that? Well, you keep doing the aerobic work. You keep putting in the aerobic miles. You know, so you, that's why practices have to be practiced. They're not events like, oh, you know, I think I might get depressed a little bit in the upcoming holidays. I'll schedule a Saturday morning to go take a long walk in nature and get myself all tuned up for the fourth quarter. Doesn't work. You know, yeah. This is the not, effects are cumulative. Yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's a, a somewhat long-ish answer. But so when I'll talk with that, you know, action-oriented executive, like no, 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 you you guys go do the the walk the labyrinth thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna write an email. You know, yeah, that's, that's what I like to do. You know, with bullets in it. You know, um, and um, <laughs> and so I want to talk that person into why they should care. You know, it has to do with this deeper experience. For if, sure. If you want to have a deeper experience of your own life. You got to get in the water. You can't just yeah. cross it. Yeah. I feel like we just got a preview of your next book. So thank you. As a matter of fact, yeah. this is a, We're doing a prototype today. That's what we're doing. Excellent. If you go, huh? I don't get, that doesn't make any sense at all. I talk to these people all the time. They don't care about that shit. You know? exactly. you like, oh, that, that's a feedback loop. Hey, Bill, we need to change the element. No, I think it's incredibly important. And I, I do personal practices in my own life. Have I always? No, but I do at this right. point in my life. And, um, but it is a challenge to get those more pragmatic people to understand the value. So I appreciate you spending some time on that. Yeah. I mean, as, as so many different aspects of neurological and psychological research in the last 10 years point out, you know, whether it's the grit people or whether it's the social emotion people, whatever it is, you know, mindset matters. Yeah. You know, we talk about the design mindset all the time. Mindset is huge. Give you a tactical example. So my yep. new partner and I were down this weekend. She's in the process of actually making a retire a retirement like move. She's stepping away from a forty year role. Okay. And, and there are a couple of you know a couple of implementation issues that are a little gnarly. You know, after sure. years of running an organization. Um, and we got into two long and heavy 
implementation conversations, one first thing on Sunday morning and one first thing on Monday morning, and she jumped in the car to go. And, you know, and frankly, by the time she left this week, and I, we both felt kind of crummy, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, what's going on? We go, oh, and, you know, which our, our more normal practice that we completely avoided was having a morning sit, you know, you know, which I call prayer. She calls meditation. That's fine. Um, yep. And, 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 and we've had some profoundly wonderful experiences and it's in silence. I mean, we, you know, um, and that is an incredibly life-giving experience when we do it properly. And part of me was wondering, like, you know, is there something wrong with the relationship? Like, no, stupid. You know, you just dove right into complex, difficult, gnarly, mostly negatively toned transactional conversations, you know, for two hours one morning, an hour the next. And it's the first thing out of the chute, coffee yeah. and difficulty. And what do yeah. you mean? You get you get feeling crummy for seventy two hours. That's what you get. Um, yeah, we had done those important conversations with a five minute sit under our belt. My guess is, having done that before, it's transformative. So part of that is, you know, we keep saying there's all of us contain more aliveness than one lifetime permits you to live out. There's more than one of you in there. That's the big idea behind the Odyssey imagination exercise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Plan three of you. Okay, well, the same thing applies to the mindset level. You know, adopt this mindset. I mean, the wisdom traditions have known this forever. Um, so, you know, put, put on the right mind, for God's sake. You know, that's part of what that practice is about. If you haven't, you haven't got the right mind on, your chance of having the day you want to have is zero. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. The morning practice. Yeah. Is essential. So I, I just have, I have a personal question. Like, do, do you, with this new relationship, do yeah. you, do you do these morning sits together? Like in silence together? Yeah. This you know, we, yeah, it's, it's when we are in person together, we have a pretty yeah. parameter lifestyle. Yeah, no, yeah, we do. We, we, um, uh, we sit down together on the couch, you know, typically, uh -huh. um, usually, usually holding hands, um, sometimes with a dog in one or the other lap. I've got a couple of dogs. Um, um, I've got one purple dog and one very not, you know, and, um, <laughs> the, um, and the, you know, the, the meditative dog can, can stay the, the, um, yes. and that, and that's how we do it. Yeah. That's interesting. I think you might have a relationship book in you, Dave, relationships well, there, there later in here. life. Well, I'll the four, like the, the four romantic um, relationships places that we think that meaning making experience can occur, you know, which again are. Uh, you know, coherence, community, flow, and wonder. You know, community is one of them. So, it's, I mean, you know, as the as the long run, the, the long mm -hmm. behavioral study, the grand study ever in the history of mankind summarizes. You know, what what is happiness or what is meaning in, in life? Uh, George Valiant was famously quoted to say, "Oh, that's simple. It's love. Full stop." Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. And, and big studies on the fact that like people who are more social and in community have like longevity advantages. Well, yeah, the, lo well. the longest thing. In fact, a, a, a chunk of years ago, I was asked to be a keynote speaker by AARP. Uh, mm -hmm. which they launched their Living 100 theme. You know, the, the, you know, the AARP is now organized around, you're all going to live to 100, plan accordingly. So yeah. they, they launched the news that you're all going to be 100. Um, well, the great big event in, in D.C., and I was on the dais um, and, uh, and and spoke about this stuff. And then um, also um, the then and again now um, Surgeon General, right, Murthy, um, was, yeah, was speaking. I was talking to him and I was talking to him in the green room. Um, I said, so, you know, you used to be a regular doctor and now you're, you know, running around doing this political thing. How's that? You know, what's what's changed for you? And And he had. At that point, the the news about loneliness is more dangerous to you than smoking, you know, one or two bags yeah. of cigarettes a day had not quite hit the street. It was out, but it wasn't as big as it is now. And he said, oh, yeah, it's this lonely. He says, yeah, my life has completely changed. I mean, I did not know before I got this job that loneliness is the single greatest you know, epidemic in this country. He's killing us right and left, you know, uh, and he just went off on the loneliness thing. And uh, I went, OK, got it. You know, um, so, yeah, we are. In fact, we're pretty close to a guy named Dan Siegel. Uh, those are a lot of books on consciousness and uh, particularly what the most definitive book being mind sight. In fact, he's 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 got a real challenge in front of him. He's trying to sell a new word. Um, he's really pushing the word and the whole philosophy that goes with the word muy, M-W-E. Um, you know, who who 
who is a human person? A human person is a mui, because according to his research, starting in behavioral theory, then moving into consciousness, uh, we absolutely are members one of another. The, the way he will describe it is the Western misperception of the separate autonomous self is at best an error, um, most likely a scientific mistake, most honestly described as a profoundly toxic lie. We are yeah. indeed members one of another and have to really understand what it means to be literally part of one another. I am, I am an entity, but I'm an entity in communion with you and learning how to be that kind of an entity, that kind of a, a, a creature uh, is the most life-giving way and, and to, to live what he would call the integrated life, the outcome of which is compassion. That's his model. Um, yeah. becoming more human. So, so yeah. the idea of... Uh, particularly at this stage of life where I'm looking to be more alive, you know, I'm, I want to have other parts of my personality get a chance to be expressed, you know, and I want it to be meaningful and, and significant, then the community thing is, the, the relationship thing has got to be front and center. Yeah, same concept as um, David Brooks' Second Mountain, where yeah. he talks about individualism versus collective, yeah. collective yeah. community. So, uh, Dave, this has been amazing. Um, I think I could talk to you for a really long time. <laughs> Um, and I would love to have you back when you have are publishing your next book for sure. Anytime you want to come back and talk about anything. I know that my listeners are going to love this conversation. I will, of course, link to your website and the books in my show notes. Um, is there anything else that you have going on that you want to tell my listeners about? Well, I do a slight reframe on this whole, you know, encore third, third thing. In fact, I was just mm -hmm. I had coffee just this week. With a guy named Scotty McLennan, who's the recently former chaplain at Stanford. He's a lawyer and um, and a chaplain. He has a dual degree. He used to do justice law, and then he went to ch a chaplaincy. He was at Tufts, and then he was at Stanford. Um, old, old friend, lovely guy. Um, and he's also an advisor in the DCI program. He still mm -hmm. teaches a little bit at the business school on ethics and stuff like that. Uh, and, and you mentioned David Brooks' Second Mountain. And yeah. you know, having turned 70 this year, you know, I'm, I'm reading So Falling Upward by Richard Rohr and Strength to Strength by Arthur Brooks and yep. Second Mountain by David Brooks. Who, and I know both those guys a little bit. Uh, and they're everybody confuses. They're not related. They're both conservative. <laughs> but they're not related. Um, and, you know, all that stuff and like what's going on there. Um, and so um, Scotty and I were discussing the possibility of teaching what um, – you know, a second half or a stage of life survey course. There are all these different models for. So when you say, you know, the third third of the third chapter or the encore, yeah. that's inside a model of what is the what is the macro flow of a stage of life orientation, the developmental model. Well, there are a bunch of two stage models, but three stage models, and and Scott is actually particularly fond of the Hindu four stage model. Um, and so you know, the question. How's it going? You know, which talk, you know, what or, or the, the way the Greeks put it, what is the good life? Yeah. Um, is being revisited at this 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 life change moment when I'm not doing things the way I used to do, not working the same way I used to work. You know, there what most people have an unconscious framework. Like the good life is when they pay me a lot, or the good life is when, you know, the kids are happy or whatever, you know. And now I might be rejiggering my answer to that question. Like, well, how, what sh what should I do next? Well, what would bring the outcomes you're looking for or what right. how, how how do you know how's it going great justify your answer <laughs> okay. says who says who yeah right you know yeah and according to what tell me about great yeah and that's when i when i'm now hung out with um i think this is my eighth cohort of dci people um back to 2017 and yeah. um you know that is a hard question you know, what am I after? What what would define a good thing is up for grabs. Yeah. Uh, and the this thing about how do we live and how am I experiencing it that we're discussing mostly in this in this discussion, Bill and I hold that. Um, and it comes to the stage of life theory stuff. First of all, it's if the stuff we're going for later in life, um, I don't think is unique to late life. So while I'm a big fan of stage theory, I mean, I think having a model for what is and isn't different as I'm going from stage X to stage X plus one, whatever number of stages you like, you know, whatever stage you're entering, which is the, you know, N plus one stage, um, how is it different from the N stage? Uh, that matters. 
And that framework can be helpful because it's kind of freeing. However, it's all about just becoming more human. And so the next book we're going to write, we get asked over and over and over again by the publisher, especially, please write the retirement book. You know, because the boomers are a great market, right? There's a bunch of them that they've got a bunch of free time and a bunch of free money. They'll buy a book, right? You know, and everybody loves it when just my generation, just my group got the book. It's our book, you know? Um, yeah. Sorry, guys, we're not going to do that for you because we, <laughs> we're human centered designers. It's about being human beings. Yeah. And the human experience while it evolves. And, you know, when I'm talking to a 19 year old, you know, who's still nine years away from having a neocortex. I mean, it's a lot different than I'm talking to an 85 year old. You know, my mentor is 87 and dying slowly in a basement in Colorado. I mean, he's in a very different conversation, but they're all human beings. And the fundamental human questions of what matters, am I alive? What's going on? Does it, you know, now what? You know, um, those things don't actually change. What I think is unique about this later stage of life, this elder stage of life, uh, that I'm entering is, first of all, if you if you've done well enough, you have some freedom in time. Mm -hmm. If you got some health and you got some freedom, yep. Those are those are big caveats. Not everybody. Yep. Does. Um, but For if sure. you got those, then, and because you have completed a fair bit of accomplishing, you know the way Richard Rohr puts it in Falling Upward is, you know, you the first half of life is building the container of your life, and the second half of life is emptying it. You know, you can't mm -hmm. empty a container you haven't built. Um, and so, you know, you're flowing out, right. Um, and you're releasing yourself into the world and which is not pretty complimentary to Arthur Brooks's, you know, other strengths from one kind of strength to another kind of a strength. Right. Um, so these models are helpful, but the whole point, that's all part of the human experience. And what Bill and I are going to say in the third book about this meaning making stuff is it's always available all the time to everyone. But yeah, I would argue it is uniquely available yeah. and important to people later in life. Yes. You know, so, hey, boys and girls, here's <laughs> the good news. You're, you're entering what deserves to be the most satisfying time of your life by far. And if you talk to healthy, older people, I mean, healthy in, in a very broad definition. Yes. You know, got relationships, they're, you know. Um, Mental, they're, physical. They are the happiest bit. people on the planet. Yeah, I Absolutely. believe it. I mean, I, you know, you, you, I mean, my kids are 36 to 42 and they're young and they're strong. And my, my eldest son now can totally kick my ass on a mountain bike. And, you know, um, you, you couldn't pay me to be one of those people for all the money in the world. Yeah. Thank God I'm not 22. Oh my, <laughs> you know, um, so it's really, really cool to get older, you know, if, if you're not in a lot of pain yet. Um, yeah. And, and there exactly. are huge, huge invitations. Don't miss them. Right. Through all the time. They miss it. They are, they don't have a plan. They're not thinking about, you know, how they're going to well, truly just, live. They're just going to ground. They're doing what they know how to do. Yes. They're doing what they're they've doing always they're done. Doing. Yeah. I'll close with this story. So I was um, I, uh, I, nine months ago, um, and um, a group of one of the cohorts at DCI um, got together. After, this after their year had been done, some people had continued to look. There are some continuing ongoing students. There are a bunch of graduates couple of locals so still in Northern California, but 20, pretty good sized chunk um, of the group got together and the question got asked, so how are you dealing with your transition back to regular life now that you've left your year off at Stanford? Go around the circle and check in on it. Two and a half hours later, meaning eight to 12 minutes per person. This is not, I'm doing okay. You know, we're like, oh, no, no. All good. Yeah, well, no, no, it was like, well, you know, what's really going on for me is, and then nine minutes later, we get the next person. That happened 20 times in a row. Um, and by my count, two, kind of two out of the 20 people who shared said, you know, I th I'm really good. I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really accepting where I am. I think I'm participating. I really feel like I'm enjoying the flow of things. And so they were really in it. Yeah. You know, and, and at peace with it. Yeah. Not, not in stasis by any means, but they were... And, and everybody else in one form or another was struggling. And the struggle largely was around, you know, and this is my summary. Um, I used to know who I was in my role-based life when I was this person. Yes. And sometimes they've been going back and doing that person's job again. But, you know, I'm, and I'm not the same person in that role. And in most cases, they're not going back to the same role at all. Right. So, and in fact, what role, what impact creation spot on the team of the productive world 
I'm in no longer feels like the center of who I am. I might still have a productive role in the world, but it doesn't mean to be what it used to me. Right. And I haven't figured out the other thing yet. So I have all this unconsciously competent muscle memory in experiencing a life that works for me, which is entirely engineered around my productive role in the world. And my productive role in the world, while important, is no longer the centerpiece. And I have the faintest effing idea how to answer the question, how are you doing? So, and I, and I think it's a little sad, Frank. I think the program, I think we need to give them a little bit of a set of tools. These are really bright people who worked at it really hard for 14 to 16 months. And yeah, these are people who've gone through the program. I mean, yeah, imagine if yeah. you the haven't even. The program doesn't the answers. The program, yeah. very loose container to help you find the answers. You know, yeah. but, now, well, there's, they all have gotten to what they're going to let go, what they're moving toward, and so on. But what, even though they've got the new life designed, yeah, living in it and feeling like that's a place I can be at home in this revised version of my self concept was not at peace yet. So this this becoming your next self, mm -hmm. you know, takes some work and time and to process. Yeah. 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 And think of it because um, your old rules for answering the question, is it working, don't apply. Jung said, you know, not only is that which got you here not going to be of help, it's in the way. Yeah. So one of the reasons people just go back and do, oh, you know, so when you hear, you know, 70 is the new 50. That's somebody giving themselves permission to just do it again. Yeah, to keep doing what they've been doing and feel doing like because that that yeah. feels safe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of people my age, you know, who are doing another startup. You know. Yeah. And, and I think a couple of them, if, if y'all can name, you know, I think they they just have a ton of juice left and they love doing yeah. this thing. Like, Absolutely. Great. And most of them, I look at them kind of like, you're just scared and you haven't got a better idea. Yeah. You're just you're just running off of that thing you know how to do. You know, um, so, you know, you got to go through a little, a little bit of confusion for a new clarity to arrive. You know, Bill Bridges old model of endings, the neutral zone of beginnings changes don't go from clarity A to clarity B. I used to do this and now I'm doing this. You used to do that. And now I'm doing, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm lost. You got to get lost to get found. You can't go, yeah. go from found to found. You go from found to lost to found. You got to go through lost. Yep. And there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> okay, sweetie. Time to Thank you so much for your time, Dave. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. This podcast is sponsored by Good Morning Freedom, my retirement coaching firm. I help executives and professionals plan the non-financial part of their retirement, like how to discover new purpose and how you want to spend your time. I offer a one-on-one -on -one coaching retirement blueprint package where we work together to discover some new avenues of exploration for your Act 3. This coaching is completely custom and will provide you with a ton of resources and support as you transition to this new stage of life. For all the details, please go to goodmorningfreedom.com services.